Tonight on Dan Abrams Live, members of the military now facing the possibility of a dishonorable discharge for refusing to get vaccinated. Forced out with a stain that could prevent you from getting a job in the future. Do we really want to punish those who've served our country for refusing the jab? I'm a big supporter of the vaccines, but this seems like a bridge too far. We'll hear from both sides. And where is Brian Laundrie? The FBI searching his house in Camper today. Now they have one of his cell phones, and we're getting our eyes on a list showing how many times police were called to the laundry house before Gabby's disappearance. This could be a big break in the case. A man waving a gun at officers and even firing at one leads to this. Incredibly, no one was hurt, but it's just another real-life example of the dangers cops face every day. Dan Abrams Live starts right now. Good evening and welcome to show number four. Should members of the military who refuse to get the COVID vaccine risk being dishonorably discharged? I don't think so. Look, I'm a big supporter of the vaccine. I don't have a problem with the military mandating them either. After all, some members of the armed forces are required to have as many as 18 different vaccines, including the COVID jab, depending on where they're serving. But all service members, no matter where they're stationed, are required, required to have nine different vaccines, including chickenpox, hepatitis A and B, MMR, rabies, typhoid, polio, influenza. You can't refuse, okay. But a dishonorable discharge? Isn't that for the highest of offenses? Desertion, fraud, murder? As a result, you lose all your vet benefits like health care, insurance, money for school or work training. You know, Republican senators Langford, Tuberville, Cruz and Marshall are now fighting to prevent active service members who refuse the vaccine from being dishonorably discharged. Senator Marshall explained it. If they're giving a dishonorable discharge, then that soldier is going to lose their benefits. They're going to have problems getting a job in the future. They'll lose their, their benefits of getting a free education as well as health care. The Biden administration has come out against an amendment to the defense budget that would prevent the Pentagon from dishonorably discharging service members who refuse to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Look, this is one of these topics where I could be convinced that I am wrong. But it seems to me that this just goes too far. There are many in this country who fear the vaccine. I think vaccine resistance is unfounded. I think it's dangerous. But I don't think I want to punish those who've served in the military for having questions or sometimes believing disinformation. A dishonorable discharge is for people who've done a disservice to the country, it seems to me, not for those who refuse. I don't know. Maybe they're misguided, but that's different. We're going to hear from both sides of this. But let's start with Jeremy Butler, the CEO of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. He served in the Navy and has worked for the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of the Navy. Thanks so much uh, for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. All right, look, you have served. I have not. So maybe I am missing something here. But why the, the draconian punishment of a dishonorable discharge for someone who fears the vaccine for whatever reason. That's, yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Dan. And what I'd say is you need to take a step back and don't think about it as a punishment for refusing uh, a specific vaccine. Think about it as a refusal to follow a lawfully provided order. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a vaccine, if you're talking about a deployment order, if you're talking about an order to report to your next duty station, you raise your right hand to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And part of that means following the orders that you're given. It doesn't matter if it, in your view, is a small order or a big order. If it's a lawful order, you follow it. And, and let me just add, you know, this isn't hypothetical to me. I did serve on active duty. I'm still in the reserves right now. So this affects me. I've been ordered to get the shot. I have got the shot. Um, and that's part of being in the military. You know, you rattled off some of the, the vaccines that were required to get. Uh, just before coming on here, just out of curiosity, I went online uh, to check my medical record to look at some of the others that I've been uh, given over the years. And it, it's kind of crazy uh, when you realize just how extensive that is. That's part of being in the military. You know, I've been given the smallpox vaccine, yeah. typhoid, yellow fever, anthrax. I mean, the list goes on and on. I Welcome to the military. Uh, fair enough. I, I, I get that, except there is something different. It's not that the vaccine is different. It's that the environment we're living in 
is different. And as a result, I can understand where people who may get information from only one source will be afraid. Um, and they will say, you know what? I'm afraid for myself. I'm afraid for my family. You say it's not a punishment, but a dishonorable discharge will, as you know, mess up the rest of your life. I mean, isn't there some, I say this as someone from a sort of support the troops perspective to say, I feel bad for these guys and I don't want them to be punished like that with a dishonorable discharge. And I don't either, you know, and I think that's why the Department of Defense is doing everything possible to educate service members properly. I don't think we can let disinformation decide how we run our military. And that's the problem here. At the end of the day, it's a bigger issue of disinformation running rampant in this country. And it doesn't matter if we're just talking about vaccines, global warming, you name it. We cannot let disinformation, misinformation, straight up lies change how we run a institution, especially as important as the Department of Defense. I'm absolutely with you. I hope it doesn't come to the point of anyone getting a dishonorable discharge because you're right. That is a very severe punishment but so is not following orders within the military. Uh, so, you know, yeah. the military has been given a lot of time uh, to get their vaccines. It's not as if they have to have it by tomorrow. Uh, we're taking the time to educate uh, every service member, and hopefully they realize that this is the safe, correct thing to do, uh, and they follow through and get the, uh, get the, the vaccine. Jeremy, thank you so much uh, for coming on the program. We appreciate it. Now on the other side of this argument, is Greg Rinke. He's representing multiple clients in the military seeking COVID vaccine exemptions. Greg, thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate your time as well tonight. Um, you know, what do you make uh, of that argument, which you just heard, which is it's a lawful order. It's like every other order when it comes to a vaccine. And as a result, you don't want to follow an order. You get the punishment that comes with it. Well, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of most uh, troops that if they fail to follow the order, they're likely going to receive what's called non-judicial punishment. And then if they are separated from the military, they're going to be separated from the military with either a general under honorable conditions discharge or an other than honorable discharge. The, the vast majority, and I would, I, I would highly doubt that any troops are going to be dishonorably discharged. A dishonorable discharge is reserved for rapists, child molesters, and the worst right. of the worst. So it's more than likely if they are discharged, they're going to be discharged with a general or an other than honorable discharge, which still is going to stigmatize them in, in civilian life, and they're going to lose some of their benefits. But it's more than likely not going to be a dishonorable discharge. But... But, but it does seem that that remains a possibility. I mean, I, I hear you um, that, that there are other options, right? And they've specifically been discussing other options, but there is also a resistance to simply saying, okay, let's just promise these guys that they won't be dishonorably discharged. And there seems that there's real resistance uh, to that. Um, you know, why do you think there's that resistance? Well, I mean, the only way to get a dishonorable discharge is through a court-martial. So any of these troops that uh, do not take the vaccine and take their case to a court-martial, it's going to be up to a panel of their peers um, or a military judge to, to give them that dishonorable discharge. And then that has to be approved by a general officer. So it, it, it's on the table, but the vast majority, and I would say all of the, one, all of the service members that we represent now, basically what's happening is they're getting non-judicial punishment, and then being separated with either a general or an other than honorable discharge. And, and are you fighting those? I mean, how are you fighting them? And yes. what do you make? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. So it, it, it's, one, it's one thing to say that you're not going to take the vaccine. I agree with the fact that if you violate an order, you should be punished for violating that order. But then separating service members who have served overseas in Afghanistan and Iraq and then stigmatizing them with an other than honorable discharge and taking their GI Bill benefits is unduly harsh. So we're trying to convince convening authorities and general officers to separate service members with either a full honorable or a general under honorable conditions discharge. So they're not stigmatized yeah. in civilian life. Look, and I, but I hope in the context of that, because I agree with your, your position, that you're also encouraging them to get the vaccine, saying to them, look, you get nine, you know, eight other vaccines, nine other vaccines. Sometimes you get 17 other vaccines. You know, uh, why is this one so much different? Are you saying that to any of your clients? Well, uh, of course. But remember that a lot of service members, their hesitancy is because of 
going back to the anthrax vaccine that the military you know, gave a lot of their service members in the early 90s, and it was experimental use, and then there was issues in Gulf War syndrome. So there's a lot of distrust amongst military members with vaccines, especially one that they feel has been right. rushed to into production. Yeah, all right. Um, well, look, I, I think despite my position that sides with you on the issue of uh, punishing them, boy, I hope we encourage them uh, to get the vaccines. I just don't want to punish them. That's, to me, the, the key difference. Thanks a lot for coming on the Hi. show. Really appreciate it. Coming up, progressives preparing to sink a bipartisan agreement on infrastructure. Seems to me that's bad for them and bad for the country. And a shootout between police and a suspect forces a cop to shoot through the windshield to protect himself. It's all caught on dash and body cam. Sean Sticks Larkin from Live PD joins us to dig in on this insane moment coming up. Welcome back. You would have thought a vote to fund the government would have bought some time for progressives to come to their senses and pass a $1.2 trillion bipartisan, and let me stress that word, bipartisan infrastructure bill that's currently on the table. But apparently it's not enough time because progressives are preparing to sink it. This whole thing makes me kind of nuts. If you're anything but the far left of the Democratic Party, or the far right of the Republican Party for that matter, you should want this bill to sail through Congress. Instead, the progressives are threatening to hold out, demanding that a separate $3.5 trillion package be passed as a condition for their support. Now, if you watch MSNBC or CNN, you'll see a regular parade of progressives demonizing moderate Democratic senators Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema as if it's their fault that the progressives tied the two issues together. Until Senator Sinema stops being cute and starts doing her job and leaving for the people of Arizona, we're simply not going to be able to move the president's agenda forward. It is saddening to see them use Republican talking points. We obviously didn't envision having Republicans as part of our party. Senate Republicans are gleefully cheering on economic destruction, full stop, and solely to make a purely political point to punish President Joe Biden and Democrats for wanting to pass a once-in-a-lifetime proposal that would reshape the economic future for Americans like you. The progressives keep talking about how this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to pass this separate spending bill to enact social programs they've long pushed for, such as expanding Medicare, universal pre-K, tuition-free community college. But if Manchin and Cinema aren't on board, and they have no Republican support, it's not a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's not an opportunity at all. It's not happening. And it's a separate issue. The $1.2 trillion bipartisan bill, which passed 69 to 30 in the Senate, provides among other things, $110 billion for roads and bridges, $65 billion for the power grid, $55 billion for water infrastructure, $47 billion for cybersecurity, $21 billion for the environment. So it seems the progressives are prepared to lose those infrastructure upgrades, not because they're not good, but because they're not good enough. Even from their perspective, it should be about doing something good for the country, even if it's not great and transformative. Earlier today on Capitol Hill, Manchin announced he's willing to move his top line number up to $1.5 trillion on the separate bill. And he rightly puts the onus for the gridlock on the far left where it belongs. You communicated this top line number to Congresswoman Jayapal or any progressives in the House who are now threatening to sink the infrastructure bill today. Yeah, there's a shame for that because no two bills should ever be linked together to the point where you're going to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Never. I've never. I've been around for an awful long time in state and now in federal politics, and that should never be the case. Sounds like it makes sense. One person who's celebrating the far left's intransigence is former President Donald Trump. For weeks, Trump has been railing against the bill, calling for the, quote, rhinos who passed it to be voted out of Congress, much notably, most notably, Mitch McConnell. The former president wants this to fail because if it passes, it shows that the parties can work together. And politically, that's the last thing that Donald Trump wants you to see under a Biden presidency. 
So we have President Trump and his supporters joining with the far left to try to sink this because it's not good enough for any of them. The rest of us in the middle who just want infrastructure upgrades and want the government to work in a bipartisan manner like it's supposed to become the losers in all this. Joining me now to talk about the latest in what has been a crazy week on Capitol Hill is News Nation's Washington Bureau Chief Mike Vicara. Mike, it is great to be with you again. You and I are old hey. pals from back in the day. <laughs> so bring us up to date, first of all. Is this really dead? Ed, Dan, it's great to be with you. I got to tell you right off the bat. No, it's not dead. And listen, Manchin's $1.5 trillion proposal, the number he put out there in front of a scrum of reporters outside the Capitol, is not a hard number. It's also a negotiating position. It's not over until, well, the fat lady sings, as they used to say in sports. Uh, but the artificial deadlines in Washington are always coming and going, Dan. Uh, and this is a negotiation uh, that doesn't have a set deadline, uh, perhaps by the end of the year, and it's likely to continue until then. Yes, everybody talks about Washington gridlock. Everybody talks about nothing to get done. Just a couple hours ago, they passed a spending bill uh, to keep the government open for nine more weeks, and they celebrated like it was a great ac accomplishment, which is in itself an indication of the dysfunction in the legislative process and politics in Washington. Uh, but this, look. You talked about it. The progressives feel like this is their only point of leverage that they have. It's not done yet. There's still going to be talks going on. As it stands right now, as I stand here right now in the Capitol, uh, the Speaker of the House is meeting with administration officials. A few of them just walked out of her office. They're trying to find a way to force this uh, infrastructure bill, the smaller one, the roads, the bridges, the broadband, the rails, onto the House floor. Obviously, progressives feel like this is their leverage point. They're not going to vote for it. But it's not done. Dan, this is part of and the legislative process, uh, hardball one, negotiations. One of the things that people don't talk about is also that Republicans are split on this. We focus a lot on how the Democrats are divided on this. The Republicans are divided on this as well, right? There's the moderates versus uh, uh, the, what you could call the, the far right or the Trump supporters, whatever you want to identify them as. Right. Well, look, I mean, the, the poster project for the infrastructure bill is a bridge that runs from Ohio to Kentucky, right? From Cincinnati area uh, into Kentucky. People have been talking about this thing for years. Okay, Republicans are running Ohio. Republicans certainly are running Kentucky. Every senator has infrastructure needs in their state. Every senator wants broadband for their rural constituents, uh, including many mid mid Midwestern and, and Western senators. So they do want it. It's obvious that there are political pressures uh, from leadership to vote against Democrats and vice versa, because the party in power is always going to take the fall if there's dysfunction in Washington. That's, that is certainly part of the incentive here, Dan. Right. All right, Mike Vicara, we look forward to seeing you a lot here. Great to see you. Absolutely. Great to be with you. All right. And I hope that this infrastructure bill passes. Coming up, where is Brian Laundry? The plot thickens as the FBI returned to search his home looking for more answers in the death of Gabby Petito. Plus, new info on how many times police were called to the Laundry house. News Nation's Brian Enton has been all over this story. He has all the late breaking details. Plus, a media company you've probably never heard of called Ozzy was a darling of the liberal media establishment until a bombshell report revealed what insiders knew about phony numbers and potential fraud. Did it survive this long because its founder was adored by the liberal establishment? Coming up. The manhunt for Brian Laundrie heated up today with the FBI back at the family's North Point, Florida home today. According to the Laundrie family lawyer, Stephen Bertolino, Investigators were collecting some of Laundrie's personal items to assist canines in their search. You know, who knows if he would actually know or if he's actually being totally honest about it anyway, but we'll see. The FBI issued an arrest warrant for Brian Laundrie over a week ago. At this point, he's officially wanted for using a debit card and a pin not belonging to him. At least that's it for now. Now, many have wondered whether he might have died trying to survive in the wilderness or even in his own hand. And, you know, while that is possible, I would think if that had happened, they would have likely found his body already. So I think he's probably still out there. But let's get out to Northport, Florida. News Nation's Brian Enton is outside the Laundry family home. Brian has been all over uh, this story, breaking news. Brian, what's new tonight? 
Well, new tonight, you mentioned it. It was a surprise this afternoon. We're just sitting out here like we always are, and all of a sudden, a black FBI SUV rolls up just after one o'clock. Two agents get out. They go right inside the laundry family house behind me. They're carrying a big brown paper bag. They take that inside. It's full of stuff. They go inside about 10 minutes, they come back out, and they go right to this camper that you see behind me, Dan. They open up the camper. They had a very small little glass uh, cylinder that they put evidence in from inside the camper. They put that into a cooler. Then they went back into the SUV and they were gone. The whole thing took about 30 minutes. What's up with these phone calls that came from the family home? When I first saw that, I was thinking, wow, that's a big deal. The police were at the home before and after Gabby's disappearance, what do we know on that? Yeah, so today we finally got the records back for all of these police reports related to the Laundry family house. A lot of the more recent ones sort of make sense. It's the family calling the police because of the protesters outside. They actually called the police on Dog the Bounty Hunter when he showed up banging on their door and things like that. What was more interesting was there were two calls that related to the house that were made on September 10th, which is the day before Gabby went missing. And then there were three calls made on September 11th, the day Gabby was reported missing. Uh, we've learned tonight that most of these calls were actually from the Petito family uh, trying to track down their daughter. Uh, and we've been going back and forth with Northport police. It's interesting because the police are saying there was some confusion in the beginning because according to Florida law, uh, they were telling the Petito family that they actually needed to report the missing case in the state where Gabby went missing from, which would have been Wyoming or Utah. So they were trying to explain to the family who they needed to call. And it appears there was a lot of confusion uh, when all of this started. All right, so as of now, those phone calls don't seem as sort of potentially significant as maybe they seemed when we first heard about it? Exactly. We got some clarification just within the last hour from okay. the police saying uh, that most of the calls were from the Petitos. All right, got it. Brian, thank you. Keep up the great work out there. Thanks, Straight Dan. ahead, a police pursuit coming to a head after a suspect shoots at police. The madness is caught on dash and body cam. Retired Lieutenant Sean Sticks Larkin is standing by live to walk us through that explosive video up next. Now to our police cam segment, our continuing effort to show you a side of policing many in the media don't want to focus on, and that is the dangers police face on a regular basis. Tonight, an officer in Illinois forced to shoot through his own windshield during a chase. The dangerous and life-threatening moments caught on dash cam and the officer's body camera. It happened during a chase back in June in Decatur. The suspect drove through a neighborhood, potentially putting innocent people in the line of fire. The officer had been sitting in his police cruiser in a parking lot of a church, filling out paperwork. It's when Marcus Boykin drove up to the police car, then shot at the officer off camera. Fortunately, the officer was not hit. Boykin then drove off, leading police on a pursuit. They say Boykin continued to wave the gun around during the chase, even pointing the weapon at himself. His next move, pointing the gun at the officer. Now, fearing for his life, the officer opened fire, shooting through his windshield, the suspect sped off into another parking lot. Police threw down spike strips to get Voikin to stop. He was arrested and charged with attempted murder on a pol police officer. No officers or the suspect were hurt. I want to look at more of that video um, because I don't think we even showed some of the, the sort of most difficult part of that. But to break it down is my friend and former co-host of Live PD, retired Tulsa Police Lieutenant Sean Sticks Larkin. Sean, great to have you uh, back on the show. You, Appreciate it. All yes, right, so sir, this is well, one man. of these situations. I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to play the video over, over your talking here. And, you know, this is one of these moments, right, where police officer is filling out paperwork and then suddenly in his head has to completely change his perspective on the situation. Take us through it. Yeah, you know, as far as the officer parked in a church parking lot, that's something commonly we all do. Um, obviously, paperwork is a huge part of this job. You try to find an isolated, what we consider a safe place where you can kind of see somebody turning into the parking lot so you can do your job. 
And this was actually just a cowardly act. I mean, this is an ambush, driving right up next to the officer and then firing that shot. So luckily the officer's not hit and he's able to engage in the pursuit. Um, during the pursuit, as you mentioned, the suspect waves the gun around, points it back at the officer. For the officer to have the mindset, um, he's clearly done what we call mental reps. He has practiced this type of scenario in his mind that if this happens, if I'm engaged in a gun battle while in my car, how am I going to handle it? And he reacted appropriately. So let's, I want to play again the, the moment when the officer shoots through his own windshield. Let's take another look. You know, Sean, I you know, think most people that, don't realize. Go ahead, go ahead, Sean. No, I was gonna say exactly. That tactic right there, you know, I came on the police department in 1997. And this was something that wasn't discussed or taught even in the academy. But thanks to body cams, thanks to dash cams, um, you know, when these type of things have happened and one officer has thought about it or it's been trained somewhere else in the country, it spreads through the law enforcement community. Like, hey, here is a viable option that if you're in your car in this type of situation of what you can do. Um, you know, getting out of the car would have put him out in, uh, you know, harm's way. He was able to, you know, try to eliminate that threat from inside of his car. And Sean, what most people don't realize is how few police officers in America ever fire their service uh, weapons. That the vast majority of them never, ever, in the course of their duty, fire their weapons. So that moment for an officer like that is going to be this is not this is not routine this is not every day this is a moment where the officer is going to remember it for a long time yeah honestly you know i've been in two shootings myself um both of them happened just as fast as this one split second you don't think it's going to happen but you are mentally prepared for it um, so, it, it, you know, here in the audio of this, you can actually hear the officer, how deep he is breathing at times, because you do, you get so amped up and you have to literally walk yourself through coming back down and staying calm and focused to protect yourself or anybody else potentially out there. Yeah. And as you've explained to me before, that anytime there is any sort of significant incident, be it a shooting or even less than that, Typically, you'll want other officers to come to the scene afterwards because the one officer will be so, you know, amped up and, and so, you know, um, energized, whatever the word is, over what had just happened. And you don't want that officer then following up on the incident. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, and use the word amped up. And, and I've seen it the opposite. You know, um, I was one of the officers that responded to officer involved shootings to counsel or be present with other officers because I've been through those situations myself. And everybody reacts different. You have some of the hardest, toughest guys that are out there on the street and they get involved in a deadly force in, in, uh, incident. And once the realization of what they've just been through, how close they came to potentially dying, how close uh, you know it came to them taking somebody's life or possibly they did. And they have a big, big mental drain and some guys just break down. Everybody handles it differently. Yep. Um, and that's why it's important for these agencies to have other officers to go through it with them. Yep, and, and this is to remind people, neither the officer or the suspect in this particular incident uh, ended up getting hurt. Um, Sean Larkin, great to have you on the show. We're looking forward to you being a regular right here on the, uh, on the program. We'll see you again soon. Yes, sir. Coming up, a darling of the liberal media establishment accused of being all smoke and mirrors, but it's gotten almost no cable news coverage. Sure feels like a double standard at work here. That's up next. Welcome back. If I told you there was a media company run by a well-connected, charismatic conservative, which had raised tens of millions from conservative leaders and had partnerships with major conservative media companies, and then if I told you that its co-founder digitized his voice on a conference call to pretend to be a YouTube executive talking about how awesome the company is, and that the New York Times exposed said business as largely being a fraud, you would presume the story would be covered beyond the world of the inside the media bubble critics. Be everywhere. 
But as you can probably guess, this story is about a progressive media darling you still may have never heard of. The company is called Ozzy, and it claimed to have a huge audience. And its host was, quote, they had billboards, the best interviewer on TV. Over the weekend, the New York Times' Ben Smith detailed how an Ozzy executive impersonated a YouTube exec in a brazen attempt to close a $40 million investment from Goldman Sachs. It's a plan so crazy, even Ferris Bueller probably would not have dared to try it. And now the FBI is reportedly looking into it. Once Goldman figured out what was going on, Ozzy's chief executive, Carlos Watson, admitted what happened and apologized for their COO and his co-founder, Samir Rao's effort and blamed it on a mental health issue. Even tried to take credit for standing behind him. Quote, this was a very personal mental health issue that afflicted a very good friend and a valued colleague. Ozzy took the matter seriously. We reviewed it and decided to treat it for what it was, a medical issue. Except that before the conference call even took place, someone provided the Goldman Sachs team with a fake email address for their fake YouTube rep. Now, Watson denies being the source of the fake email address. Carlos Watson is a former CNN and MSNBC personality and is the company's top on-screen talent, in addition to its chief executive. I've met Carlos. I like him. He's a, a nice guy. He helped Ozzy land more than $70 million in investments from people like Lorraine Powell Jobs and Milwaukee Bucks owner Mark Lasry. Earlier today, Lasry resigned as Ozzy's chairman after taking the job earlier this month. Now, he had defended Ozzy in the New York Times article. For years, Watson and Ozzy raised eyebrows over claims about its audience size, this despite few people outside of the media world even knowing it existed. The numbers simply didn't add up, but no one asked why. So if Ozzy had been pushing Trumpist talking points, would people have asked more questions about the claims that it was making? CNN's Brian Stelter called this the biggest open secret in digital media. But almost no one has covered this on cable news. Ozzy has more than 650,000 followers on Instagram, but their posts get like no engagement. Videos on their YouTube page get tons of thousands of views, but almost no likes or comments, but makes it sound like they're buying their clicks. Hillary Clinton, Malcolm Gladwell, Jamel Hill, and other Democratic favorites have made appearances at the Ozzy Fest. Now, Mark Lazary's son, Alex, is running on the Democratic primary for Ron Johnson's Senate seat. Watson continues to serve on the board of NPR, which he joined in 2016. So my question is, why were so many willing to turn a blind eye despite all the red flags? Seems obvious to me. But joining me now is Colby Hall, founding editor at Mediate.com, a site that I founded and a producer here on Dan Abrams Live. All right. So, Colby, how to, I mean, it's the ultimate question. How did this happen? Brian Stelter says it was an open secret. What does that mean, an open secret? So no one, no one actually called them out on it? Um, to call Aussie media right now a dumpster fire would be an insult to dumpsters and fires because both fires and dumpsters give some utility. Um, it, it, it's a big deal, and it's a, as you said there, it's like um, it's pretty damning of the media. Like the media, just this is a huge story, and everyone has heard Aussie media, but I can't think of any time that I personally or even have a friend that shared with me, oh, I heard this great thing on Aussie. I did this. So it's clearly, it was almost as though it was hiding out in open, really. And so that Carlos Watson and the other founder, it reminds me of that book, Catch Me As you, If You Can, where it was just a series of falsehoods and lies built on one another. And then it finally caught up with them. And credit to Ben Smith for doing really yeah. solid reporting. But, but it seems that everyone is scared to talk about it. And I say that because... You know, as much as we wanted to book you for this segment, um, we actually reached out to a ton of other people and no one wants to talk about it. I mean, it really seems like people are like afraid for whatever reason to discuss this. And again, it just feels like if this were a company that had different leadership, um, different political affiliations, that the media, I mean, there's, there's been almost no references to this on cable news. Well, first of all, I know that I'm near the top of the list of people that you bought. Of course, uh, of course, of course. Of course. Um, I think we had a... to buy those clothes for you at the Gap. <laughs> Can did. we be honest? Yeah. So, yeah. Didn't work. No, but um, I, I think there was a weird phenomenon where the media sort of overlooked this, and the more that came out, it was sort of a recognition of how did we miss this? And, you know, there could be some politics aside. I don't think it's purely 
uh, progressive thing. I think sort of, you know, being naive and getting duped is a bipartisan trait for these uh, investors. But I think a lot of media reporters just kind of drop the ball. And of course, to talk about it now is an admission of their failure. Um, yeah, see, it, I, th I think part of this, though, is that, you know, Carlos, who, again, very charming guy. I mean, you know, as I said, I, I've met him sort of wowed everyone and everyone. And look, this also came at a time when all these media companies were trying to increase diversity. And Carlos was helping with that, with his company. I don't just mean him personally. I just right. mean that th the way he was doing business allowed them to say, oh, we're working with diverse companies, et cetera, which is terrific. But there was just no sense of what is this company? I mean, well, what do they do? Well, I think the other thing is the generational plan. So, you know, they were targeting themselves as a news outlet for millennials or maybe Gen Z, who are also cable cutters. And I think a lot of the investment class still aren't very aware how younger generations consume media. But that was all a ruse, as it turns out, because even the Gen Z and millennial targets weren't going there. Right. So, it, you know, and by the way, the argument there for the investment is if you get in early, over 20 years, if you keep those eyeballs and that brand builds, that's a, that's a, you well, get a good return. But the, the beauty of the, the argument about the Gen X and the millennials is that, you know, probably older folks, right, like the Goldman Sachs people or whatever, the, 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 the people can say, well, you guys wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it's the millennials who love us. Yeah, you, you guys wouldn't know about it. That's why it never crosses your feed or anyone's feed. But it just, it does seem like, again, and I know I keep coming back to the political side of this, and it's not purely political, but... The, ex the fact that people still don't want to talk about this and seem really uncomfortable discussing this story to me says something about, you know. It's, you know, like it's a dumpster fire, not just for Aussie media, but it, it doesn't paint the media reporters, including people in media and myself, uh, in the most favorable light. Yeah. Um, and it came out, and I suspect the story is just starting. Eugene Robinson works at. Uh, at uh, Ozzy, and he has a piece coming out on Sunday that's going to be, I think, pretty much explosive uh, for oh, Washington wow. Post. So we'll see that. All right. Uh, Colby Hall, we were so glad we were able to get you. Uh, <laughs> Happy for, to be here. Yeah, no, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, speaking of media, it's time for our nightly wrap of the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. Our Mediate Moments are coming up next. Time now for our Mediate Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and the bull in the world of cable news and beyond. Some high-profile NBA players are publicly expressing the reasons why they are not getting the COVID vaccination, which has created a strange mix of media, sports, and politics. Texas Senator Ted Cruz came out in support of these players, tweeting, I stand with Kyrie Irving, Andrew Wiggins, Bradley Beal, Jonathan Isaac, NBA, your body, your choice. Your body, your choice. I know what you did there. But Cruz hasn't always been a huge fan of NBA players taking a stand on an issue of public concern. It's painful watching what the NBA, what they're doing right now, because they're, they've essentially decided that half their fans are, are idiots and, and racists, and they're just going to insult them, and, and they're going to lecture them. And, and when you watch an NBA game now, it's just it, it, the announcers are, are engaged in political tirades the whole time. Senator Cruz, of course, has every right to support anyone or anything he wants. But the strange phenomenon of situational support of professional athletes being spokespeople or role models for causes is pretty striking. Take, for example, Fox News contributor Clay Travis, who once made a big name for himself mocking NBA players, making statements publicly about Black Lives Matter, but now on the vaccine resistance. They are standing up for the rights of their individual athletes about whether or not they should have to be vaccinated for COVID. I'm just asking for a level of consistency in your position. Maybe the best example of hypocrisy goes back to Laura Ingram's famous diss of LeBron James coming out against Trump. Keep the political commentary to yourself, or as someone once said, shut up and dribble. So if your position is we shouldn't listen to athletes on issues outside of sports, okay. Except that's very different from, for example, what she said about Drew Brees' complaints about kneeling during the national anthem. He's allowed to have his view about what kneeling and the flag means to him. I mean, he's a person. He has some worth, I would imagine. I mean, this is beyond football, though. This is totalitarian, totalitarian conduct. This is a bipartisan phenomenon, by the way. 
Here's how Joy Reid reacted to Ingram's comments then. There is this extent to which Fox News has decided that the, 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 the grist for the ratings mill yes. is black people. Right. Black NFL players, black NBA players. So three years ago, she's calling out Fox News for taking shots at NBA players. And then this week, she was taking a shot at NBA players. We're talking about black players who have a lot of fans and a lot of influence and are parroting some of the anti-vax stuff that we hear just in our circles. And if they're saying it, if Kyrie Irving is saying it's just a conspiracy, it's very hard, you know, for you to get your cousin to, you know, to get vaccinated as well. So if an athlete says something you agree with, then it's a voice that should be heard. You know, I think Charles Barkley has this right. I don't know who's worth the league of people, the Democrats or the Republicans. That's all three of y'all are shit. Y'all are screwed up our country. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, I says the Democrats and Republicans are the two worst things that ever happened to America. And now we have to pick a, a, the, the least of two evils. And it's just, it's a joke right now. We're trying on this show every night to bring you both sides as much as we can uh, to lay out somewhere in the middle um, where things are. So each night, as I think you can tell, I'll take positions on things. I'll tell you where I stand. I'll tell you what I think. You may agree with me. You may not agree with me. But the one set of people who are not going to like this show on a regular basis are going to be the political extremes because they're going to think I'm too liberal or I'm too conservative. But I'm hoping that those of you out there will say, you know what? The rest of us are somewhere near the middle. The rest of us are left of center, right of center. Anyway, thanks for watching another edition of the show. This is the fourth show we have done. And I hope they're getting better and better each night because we're figuring out the kinks each night. I'm trying to make it just a little bit better. Thanks for watching. See you back here tomorrow night for another edition of the show.